Well, hi, my name is Keith Wright, and I am a financial professional with Thrivent Financial. And I am thrilled today to be able to promote two of my very good friends. So first of all, Pete Turner. Pete, I've known for about 35, 40 years. He was what I call a kid in my youth group when I was a youth pastor in Walnut Creek, California, back in the mid-1980s. And uh, we had a lot of fun, a lot of memorable experiences, and uh, built actually lifetime memories that every time people from the youth group are together, we just tell stories and remember what a special time that was um, in that group. And a lot of that had to do with the culture that was built in the youth group. It was a culture of fun and of adventure and of deep and meaningful relationships and of uh, caring for one another and caring for the world around us. So uh, just really thrilled about Pete coming up on his 1000th episode of the Break It Down show. Absolutely amazing that he sits out here in his yurt day by day and records uh, very interesting cultural conversations uh, that, you know, help us all think more deeply and more completely about the things that are going on in our world. And so when I was thinking about Pete and his podcast, I thought immediately of my friend Lisa Jackson. Lisa is the founder and the president of Corporate Culture Pros. And for about the last 22 years, Lisa has been working with Fortune 100 companies, helping them not only to think about their profitability, but about creating world-class cultures where people want to work at these companies and want to make a difference uh, through their work. And uh does some very unique work, work around that. More recently, Lisa has been working in the field of mergers and acquisitions. So a lot of times two companies may come together and the companies do a lot of great due diligence around the uh, financials of the two companies coming together, but they don't often think about the type of culture that they like to see emerge uh, with two corporate entities coming together. And Lisa is an expert of helping uh, corporate executives envision what they want to bring about culturally for their companies. So I, it's, I'm thrilled today to be able to promote Lisa and introduce her to Pete and have her be interviewed on this podcast of the Break It Down show. You know, going back to what I do as a financial advisor with Thrivent Financial, one of the reasons I joined Thrivent uh, four and a half years ago was because they have a very unique culture. At Thrivent, we believe that money is not a goal, but it's a tool, a tool to help us accomplish our dreams and goals as a family, um, as individuals, and also to give back to our families and to our communities. And so one of the things that is a really a hallmark of the culture at Thrivent Financial is our generosity program. So we actually are a not-for-profit organization and give away uh, in the neighborhood of $330 million a year in seed money to help our members, our investors, uh, you know, lean into the charities of their choice to do community service projects, to uh, promote fundraisers, and to give back to meaningful charities in the communities that we serve. And so I'd uh, like to just encourage anybody that is looking for a financial advisor, a financial professional to look at Thrivent. It's a way not only to get great returns on your investments and to protect yourself against the setbacks that might come along in life through insurance products, but also to look at our generosity programs and ways to give back to the charities that are most meaningful to you. So I'm going to turn it over to Pete and to Lisa now, and I'm so grateful for this opportunity to introduce the two of them to each other and to you. Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The this Offspring. This is Nathan This e. is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl Eames. This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. <laughs> Hey, this is Lisa Jackson, and you're watching The Break It Down Show. And now, The Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. This is a red letter day for me. I've been trying to get Keith right on the show forever. Here I am not introducing the guest first, but um, I just wanted to say Keith is co-hosting with me. Keith has known me as long as anybody has. And uh, he's like, hey, you got to have Lisa Jackson on the show. She's awesome. And so, Keith, tell us why we have Lisa on the show. Well, Lisa 
is uh, the premier speaker and consultant on all matters of corporate culture. Uh, right. Written a couple books, been in the consulting industry for about 20 plus years and has uh, worked with uh, Fortune 100 companies and just has a lot of uh, great insights into corporate culture and why culture matters and how companies and organizations can really attend to their culture in very meaningful ways that are going to bring about growth and um, and uh, better satisfaction among the workforce. So just thought that she'd be a great person for you to interview, Pete, and uh, provide a lot of her insights. I love it. Yeah, this is, I mean, everybody who knows me knows that I know quite a bit about culture because it kept me alive overseas and everything. So it's always great to meet a fellow uh, culture wonk and talk about this thing. Tell us, what is culture to you? Yeah. Um, I should read the back of the yogurt container because I think that's going to be a better definition than anything. Seriously. <laughs> um, <laughs> they help me out here. What is culture? No. <laughs> I don't know if it's easy. This is the thing is that people don't realize how hard of a question that is. And if you were to ask a hundred people, you would literally get five thousand answers. I had one. This is taking Lisa off the hook a little bit. I one time someone said, "I hate living in Las Vegas. There's no culture here." And I said, "Okay, what's culture?" She said, "There's no grass." Okay, I mean All she's right. not wrong, but that's not a very comprehensive definition. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's a really good question, actually, especially now, because you've had like 90% of the of the organizational life has gone remote and is doing work this way, you know, and I've been asking that question myself of what is culture in a remote work world, you know, where you're sitting in your sweatpants and you're, you know, casting yourself out on Zoom and you're sitting in meetings that don't have real people in the room. And, you know, I think that to me, I look at it differently. So there's a lot of definitions around the corporate version of culture, which is just how we get things done around here. But that seems pretty trite. And I feel that what it really boils down to is how you make people feel like they want to be there. And that's that's the modern definition of culture. Because in, when I graduated college and started my career, you were just so happy to have a paycheck. And that was the mentality then. And you've got a whole generation of people now that think differently. As you got heard, you know, heard you talking about the just millennial generation, oftentimes even applying for a job is an arduous task for them. Right. <laughs> and because they'd rather just become an Instagram star, you know, or freelance their way to happiness. Right. And so companies actually have to build cultures now that have grass and all kinds of other fun things that distract us from, you know, the boringness of work. Yeah, I, I know you're right about that. And I also know that when I say this, you're going to agree. Culture despises design, you know, like it just will not tolerate. It is that to make that work is not that's why you exist is to help companies get that figured out. You can say you've got this fantastic culture, but the reality is something completely different. What they're talking about outside the building, <laughs> that's your culture, right? <laughs> you know, and you're right about that. I mean, it, 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 it's funny that you would say that because a lot of the clients that we've worked with have told us that our primary uh contribution was to reveal the real truth about what was what people were feeling and thinking about the culture and you know so it takes that not native uh, to your own land is never going to be able to come in to an organization and have ask questions like i ask and have anybody right. tell the truth about it you know so yeah i do think but they would tell me you know you helped us architect this culture journey and i would just sort of smile and smirk a little bit because you're right. It actually has to be more organic than than contrived. And I think that so much of the time people think the culture is the posters on the wall. It's the mission statement that we tout in our meetings. And, you know, that really has very little to do with whether or not people want to show up to work in your company and, and stay there. You know, kind of has to do with whether I really like my boss. I mean, it sort of just comes down to that in the end. 
And yeah, this is this is true. The uh, all of the things you just said, I have a hundred things to say about because you know we've we've done this kind of cultural job. But I wanted to focus back on Keith for a second because as kids, you know, he's an adult barely, um, leader of like a youth group, and he built this youth group. I've been in other youth groups and gone to other churches and stuff, but it stuck with Keith. He built this culture where not only did I want to be there. It was okay for me to bring my friends. I, I was I was inspired mm-hmm. to bring people. And I lived across a bridge in another part of town that, like, it wasn't far away. But culturally, it was a different world and, you know, in a different county and everything. But I brought people all the time because I, I was, even if they weren't, like, you know, Christians at all, I'm like, these guys can come. They'll have a good time. And I want them to have fun with me. And Keith created that. Keith. How did you do some? How did you do that? How did you make that so powerful and and palatable to so many people? Because our youth group was was huge. I mean, we weren't trying to be the biggest one ever, but we had a blast. Exactly, and I think you know, just kind of thinking about this conversation, you know, it wasn't something that came about, you know, uh, by design or through like a strategic planning process of just do A and then B and then C and then voila, you've got this uh, uh, this youth group. You know, th- there was definitely some planning that went into it, but, you know, mainly it was coming back to some kind of essential values that I had uh, as, a, as, a, as a youth leader and as a youth pastor that uh, I was bringing, you know, into that, that setting. So a few of them just uh, top of mind would be, you know, uh, that, you know, Christianity or the youth group culture has to be a heck of a lot of fun. And so fun was like a key driver to everything that we did. And so if it wasn't fun, we weren't doing it. And um, and so not only were the things that we did were fun, but just I really had a, a value of just really pushing the envelope on that. Like, how can we make this even more incredibly fun or, you know, kind of add layers to that just to make it completely memorable and, um, you know, an outstanding type experience. So that was like one part of it. You was know, another was the value of, 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 of relationships, you know, in terms of what was the tone of those relationships. So, you know, like you kind of alluded to, everybody was accepted. Um, we had about 25 or 30 young adults. Like I was in my early 20s. All the volunteer leaders in the group were all, you know, you know kind of my peers in their early 20s as well. And we were intentionally building relationships with high schoolers and middle schoolers in order to, you know, have whatever happened in that culture and that group kind of grow out of those relationships. And then, um, you know, and and just really uh, just in a very accepting environment where anybody was welcome at any time and whatever was going on in their life and, and that was there. So, you know, there's probably four or five other key values as well that were a part and it was always coming back to those values, you know, over and over again uh, with the leadership and the culture just emerged out of reinforcing those values. You made a, a lot of decisions that would push the parents' comfort level. I know for, for sure my, my parents yeah. were like, this can't happen. This isn't right. You know, these things. Well, your dad's well, mind for me, he would always say, well, that Keith. That Keith, <laughs> yes. But the scale balanced out because I wanted to be at church more. I wanted to be involved more, you know, and then my wow. peers would look at me and see, like, see this leader guy, this guy that's bringing people into the group from a far off land, you know? And so there was a balancing of that. Like, yes, I got to be wild and crazy, which I needed an outlet for, but also here I am like, you know, leading other you know peers and going to church willingly all the time, because it was a blast for me to be at, at ch- like, that's a, Lisa, that is like an ideal for building, you know, a fantastic culture to have people excited to go do something that their parents want them desperately to do, but at the cost of also, hey, we're going to let these kids run a little bit crazy. (laughs) I think that's pretty much the formula. (laughs) Keith, I mean, said it really well about the coming back to the leadership values of the of the people who are setting those experiences in motion, and you know, if if I have spent countless hours in boardrooms with executives who are wordsmithing to death the value statements, you know, and just, I I would just, I mean, I try, I I always try not to roll my eyes in the middle of those exercises, but they're missing the point completely. 
you know, which is really what kind of experience do you want people to have working here? And that should really not have to be wordsmith. That should come out of what Keith was saying, you know, whether that's him deciding to eat dog food in front of him. <laughs> you know, but I'm not suggesting that leaders should do that, but they could. <laughs> and probably would create a lot better culture if they thought that way, you know, is creating fun at work. And there has been this mindset that I, that you are here, you know, where this is serious. We have to make money, right? We have to make profit and we have to grow the business and we have to make our numbers and we have to feed the quarterly profit machine. And, and, and man, talk about sucking the joy out of work. Yeah, no yeah. And, uh, unhappy employees are expensive employees to keep around, you know, because they're not inspired, you know. Yeah. Because- Where did that go? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 How about that? How about like the corporate model of, hey, uh, do you have a minute? And then you'll next thing you know, you're walking out with the cardboard box and the security around you. You, If you think if you run a company, if you think for one second, that doesn't freak people out that you tell people that they're part of a family and that they matter to you. And then you walk them out like they're, you know, a green mile walk that creates, that is such an expensive way to terminate people. If, I, I, I don't know the numbers for sure, but I promise if you gave a better separation package where people were like, Oh, you know, he had to go, but you know, we know he's taken care of or she was taken care of. It's uh, it's so easy to screw up dismissing people or, or cutting something so the CEO or someone gets a bonus at the end of the year, you know, like, oh, my God, you want to talk about horrible culture. Yes, your bottom line looks better, but it costs you millions of dollars that you can't even see. Yeah, that's no, that's so real. And that exercise around the layoffs and, you know, so you're describing kind of the person, the Uncle Joe that nobody really wants around and somebody finally has the courage to fire him. And because he's not doing anything and he's collecting a huge paycheck and sitting in an office, you know, that dynamic um, is one piece of it. But the other is the annual reorg, <laughs> you know, where that's not yeah. mass, right? So right. the organization is is walking people out. And, and oftentimes nothing is said about it. And, and it's just crazy to me. It's like everybody just acts as though the whole thing was a... Um, a it, 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 if it didn't happen, and yet half your family just got wiped out, as you pointed yeah. out, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Any other time in life, you know, you would think that is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so I think eliminating corporate culture is really the goal that I have and the mission I'm on is, you know, getting it to be much more like what you see. You're talking about family. I mean, sometimes families can be super dysfunctional, so I'm not sure that's the perfect metaphor, mm-hmm. you know, but certainly – uh, creating a tribe of people who have a common bond and have that joy, you know, to be there. And it's it's easier said than done, right? Yeah, oh, for sure. Because that message, so every every CEO or a C-suite person says, they, you know, they, this is our culture and everything else. And then what folks like you and I do is we say, okay, let me go find it. And then you go out and you ask those questions, right? Yeah. Like, hey, what was the last, uh, you know, what was the last company bonus that you really thought was great whether it was a perk a spiff whatever it was and when they're like ah i don't know you know i i won something but i i didn't go on the trip i'm like cool that's great because the boss wants to know that but the boss could never go find that out you know like when i worked for commanders they would all say i need to know the most influential person and i'd be new to them right so i walk in day one in their space i need to know the most influential man in this valley i already know that sir i'm pretty good at this job Oh, great, great. Who is it? It's you. And until you stop being the most influential person, none of these Afghans, none of these Iraqis can emerge as a leader. None of them can gather the people. Mm-hmm. And it drove them crazy, but didn't make it less true. You know, and, and that's what I helped them do was like, do less, work within their culture, you know, quit inventing culture for them. You know, they we always yeah. say rule of law and rule of law is harder to define than culture. Like what's rule of law? Because they have a system of laws that they work and they work through a non-penal system because they don't want to pay taxes and have this enormous penal system, right? And so they deal with things up to and including murder. Sounds like rule of law to me. But you have to translate that between the two realities, you know, the cultural realities. And so if you try to create this whole new system with courts and everything else and magistrates and all that, they understand it. But why would they use it? They have one already. And if we ignore that cultural system, whatever it is, corporate, family, whatever it is, 
you can't uh, you can't reliably get down the path that you think you're to your outcomes, right? And so you can have a corporate culture. You're like our corporate culture is family and and friends and making money. But if you and I can't go out and find it, that's not your corporate culture. Yeah. Yeah, that's well, I think, you know, I think you have a good point there. And so sometimes like when you're just reinforcing those values, you have the vision of the culture that you want to see um, unveil itself. Uh, I think sometimes you just have to let that, um, you know, let, let things go, get it on, let it go on autopilot, let, let that culture emerge. And so a lot of times we don't allow that culture to merge organically uh, because we're, you know, burdening it with, you know, with, uh, either dysfunctions of personality or with policies or with, you know, with certain goals that, that were or objectives that we're kind of putting on top of that. And so it just stifles that growth. You know, I think what you're saying, you know, Pete, there is that, you know, with your commanders, if they just get out of the way, then a culture would emerge. And so sometimes we get in a way of ourselves uh, when we're, you know, uh, and, and we basically sabotage what we ultimately want because we're, we're, mucking it up with so many different things. Yeah, and I think the biggest mucking up that's so true that leaders do is they make change happen that nobody understands. So they'll so there'll be a there'll be a merger, right? And there'll be this kind of grand story around the merger of how good it's going to be for the company and the party line around that. And I have so I had I worked with a worked with an organization that if I mentioned their name you you know you'd know out exactly outright who they are so I won't I won't do that but they bought they were they were in some what related to the propane business and they bought a company that produced barbecue tools <laughs> and it, they were in uh, uh, Raleigh Durham North Carolina and they bought this company that was in um, Queens New York. And the two leaders at the top of each of those two organizations were oil and water anyway. But then you've got New York and North Carolina, right? So culture, I think, you know, Keith talks about burning it up. There's also just these natural kind of very um, different ways of looking at the world and experience in the world. And in, in, in the end, I have seen you know, something like 70% of mergers fail and the reason they fail is because you don't have that alignment right at the top of who owns what. And people are used to when they've gotten to leadership positions, they're sort of used to like, I've arrived and I'm the boss. And, you know, that mindset is definitely the burning torch for culture. It really is. It's like if you think more flipping it to servant leadership, you're starting to get on the right track. Just what you said, Pete, you know, care enough about the people that you're stewards of to find out what they think. And what they care about that I, I have I have said that every single way I know how to say it for 20 years and I still find the blank stare coming back like what do you mean <laughs> why are you how are you doing <laughs> yeah uh, one of the things Americans abroad especially in the military state department tend to dominate things and they tend to always be the smartest person in the room, which is the worst way to do anything culturally. <laughs> yeah. Like, and I always tell them, like, don't try to out Iraq and Iraqi. Don't try to out Afghan and Afghan. Like, just like it's okay to learn, even if you already know the answer to the question. It's okay to say, how does Ramadan work again? Give them a chance to shine, and allow, and then also shut up and learn something from that. Because even if you know it, you don't know it as good as you think you do. You know, we miss these opportunities because uh, our ego gets in the way of, and again, culture, it doesn't, it, it, it and ego are like antipolar or whatever. They shove away from each other. I, at least I, that's how I think about that. What are your thoughts in terms of what does ego do with culture when they get close to each other? <laughs> yeah. It's sort of uh, yeah, like pouring acid on a, um, you know, snowball. I mean, it just, it just eliminates the, the juice of it and the, the form of it. I think, you know, and what you're saying about that question thing, I, I can't, I don't want to oversimplify or be reductive about culture, but in the end, I think that is the big aha that I've seen over the years of if there was one thing that I could get leaders to do, it would be to stop talking and ask questions and then listen to the answer. And I've taught that one principle for so many years, you know, and especially when it comes to change, which is accelerating and there's a lot of nervousness around it. And now you've got a whole generation, really the millennial generation, the younger generations that are asking these, 
kind of asking for this type of leadership. And you've got the people my generation rolling their eyes and being like, they're so entitled and they want to have a say in everything that goes on around here. And I look at them and like, go, who raised them? <laughs> like, we didn't, we can't disown an entire generation just because we're in these positions of leadership and think that we're supposed to have power over them. We, we raised this generation to expect more or to be heard at the dinner table. You know, it wasn't, it's not the children are to see, be seen and not heard generation. And so there is a lot of tension, I think, in the, in the, in the, um, organizational life around generations as well that is that is butting up against each other in terms of the values that each of those generations holds but the millennials are by 2025 if not already the majority of the workforce 75 percent of the workforce by 2025 is the prediction so who are you going to listen to yeah, and then there's those crazy digital natives. <laughs> they uh, they don't make any sense either. I, I burn two of them. They yeah. they confound me every day. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, as someone who who, who won't answer the phone a, right away. <laughs> yeah, as someone who professes to be a bit of a cultural expert, you know, it, it's hard when it's your own lens. And that's one of the things I I, I support is. You know, a commander can't go and learn their own culture. They can try to design it. They can try to emulate it. But you need a Lisa or a Keith or a Pete, somebody external to say, <laughs> you created these values. I can't find them. Or, you know, I found some other values that I think you should know about. Because the thing I learned from commanders is they're super smart and have tons of resources. And they can deal with the problem if you can relate it to them. So whether it's internal or external. You have to have someone that comes in with fresh eyes and says, you know, what should I find? All right, let me go see if I can find it. And if you can find that thing, I had this great company. The, the, guy, the guy's last name is Tuthill. They're a Midwestern company. And I had a couple of his people on because he funded a project where they flew around the world trying to find happiness in all these different people. And I heard them talk and they were, Lisa, they were so incredible. They were so ingrained with this corporate culture. It was positive that I'm like, I've got to talk to this guy because I'm hearing all the things I don't normally hear. I don't hear anger, pain, divorce, broke, all these negative values. I heard people are like, even when you leave, we work on making sure that your path is set so that you can go do the thing you're supposed to do better. And I'm like, what on earth company is this? And I had the guy Jay on and he's like, yeah, my dad was a World War II veteran, command and control kind of guy. And I said, I'm not doing that. And he went a totally different direction. Wow. But it went all the way through his company. I love that. I love what you're saying about finding the values. I think that's just so powerful. And, you know, what do you, I'm just curious, and I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this, but what do you- Of course you, you are. It's a conversation. Yeah, what, what do you <laughs> think it- it, so you just gave a really good example of that, but it, it, it's all, it, there's all these different ways that values show up. So what are some of the most important ways that you can find, you know, the true values in an organization? Because not everyone is going, they should hire a me or a kid, but they're not all going to do that. So how can leaders find that? Is it really find a question I ask? Well, and I, that's the kind of the point I wanted to jump in on, because I think you've got to be kind of a, cultural anthropologist mm -hmm. um, in terms of really understanding, you know, your culture. And I think that when you're within a, a culture for a while, that it's next to impossible to do that, you know, to be able to, to analyze and to be objective about your current culture. So, you know, again, this is uh, why you would bring in a consultant or somebody from the outside that could ask the right questions that has you know, a different uh, worldview or paradigm that they look at the culture through and be able to provide you objective feedback or alternative uh, perspectives on a culture that just seems normal and natural, you know, to you. So, for example, in my career, I served four really large um, congregations as a pastor, and I knew that the first six months were of my best time uh, to really learn the culture of the place. And what I mean by that is like, you know, uh, what are the values of this place? What are the real values? What do people talk about, you know, kind of offline um, about, about this organization? You know, how is conflict um, handled and dealt with in this organization? Um, how are decisions made? Um, what's the right process for decisions? Uh, in one church I was in, 
um, they wanted a formal proposal um, that they could vote up or down. Another church, um, they wanted to have a white paper that gave all the philosophical background of why you were making a decision, but don't give us the solution. Just outline the whole, you know, kind of situation and then we'll come up with that as leadership. Whereas in another congregation, it was the senior pastor and he made all the decisions. It was very, you know, authoritarian in that way. Well, it, these are different kind of cultural aspects, you know, of, you know, the sign up front all said Presbyterian church on them, but they were all very different culturally mm -hmm. in terms of how they, you know, they operated or, or worked. Um, so, you know, with, with that in mind, I think that um, it's, uh, you know, it's super important to, to kind of know and understand. And, and um, I always felt like part of my success, you know, um, in my career has been that I took that time in those beginning months to really understand before I was implementing any change or leading people in a different direction. I needed to understand the context of where I was before I could move it, you know, to uh, another uh, place um, organizationally. Um, and like, like I said, once you've hit six months to a year in an organization, now you're an insider and you absolutely need somebody from the outside to come in and help, you know, ask those questions and facilitate and guide those conversations going forward. Yeah. Yeah, that's an interesting example because I think that first that first green period, you know, of entering any kind of system, and and some of that is what, what you're talking about is just a form of respect. So it's a high it's a, it's a high value of yours to show respect in that way. It also just happens to be a really smart business strategy. Because if you do that, or when you do that, you as a leader, you know, you signal to people that their voice matters is one thing, but you also just find out all kinds of really big, um, uh, um, fast track kinds of things that you can change that people then trust you because they feel like you listen. They, oh, I told that guy we should do it this way. And look at this. He made the change, you know, so now I trust him. There's just, you can't buy that. Right. Well, and, and even just, you know, uh, to give you a shout out, Lisa, I know that your approach to consulting is you don't have a cookie cutter approach that applies to every single organization. You know, it's that you really have to do that, that heavy, you know, that the digging, the deep digging to understand, you know, and then come up with uh, ideas and a direction that, you know, help the organization to move to their desired future. And, uh, it, you know, and so, yeah, there's, there's really is no cookie cutter approach. You can't, there is that basic respect. I think people sense that if you come in and have like your approach and your way of doing it, then, you know, that's, uh, you know, they, they just feel like they're, they're manipulated. But if they feel like they've been asked questions, brought into the process, and then you come up with recommendations that they then embrace, then, you know, then there's so much respect in that and people are going to be on board and buy into it. And, and I think that's the, the key crux of that with culture is that it is that it, it's that thing that your employees care about almost more than anything else, mm -hmm. you know, so but leaders in the executive suite want performance. So then oftentimes I'm brought in and there's this dual agenda, you know, there's this, well, we need high performance and and and. There's like a magic wand that this consultant brings to wave over the organization and then they will start performing. <laughs> There's not? They're not big dogs, you know? I mean, even if you look at the people who train animals, they, they, the, the number one thing any one of them will say, and I'm not likening corporate culture to animals, but I am saying the number one thing is trust. And I don't think there's any substitute for that. You can feel it. And you said this, um, um, Pete, that you can feel it when you walk into a culture that has it versus one that doesn't. You can feel it, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's a couple of things I want to say about all of this stuff because there's, there's, there's just, I don't want to lose track of these moments, but this trust building. And then one of the things that I've, I've said a lot and, and it, it makes people spit the bit, but gives me a chance to, to run my mouth again. So that's part of the reason why I say it, but especially in combat, it, it's all affect over effect. And if you are like, no, affect is a verb, like go look it up and then come back. And then I'll tell you that it's a response to stimuli. Yes, it can be a verb, but in this case, and I always use the example, like I can write you 15 love letters 
it doesn't mean you're going to love me. That's effect. If I, and here's an example that happened on my flight out to Georgia. I get on my flight. I haven't flown since the pandemic started and uh, everything's done, you know, you know, stu- you know, uh, flight attendants, you know, check everything, prepare for, you know, take off. We're at that stage. Everything's done. And all of a sudden the lady walks up, a uh, flight attendant, and she looks over at me and she says, Pete Turner. And I said, oh yeah, that's me. And I'm thinking, oh crap, who's that? You know, because we're done. We're ready to go. And she said, I just wanted to take a moment. You haven't flown with us for a while. I wanted to thank you for coming back and flying with Delta. It looks like it's been since March. And I had to shut my, I hold my mouth shut. I'm like, you took the time and she was genuine. She didn't go, uh, Delta would like to thank you. Like it was a genuine thing. And I'm like, oh my God, that, you, I don't know how you mentioned that for a CEO, but that company just got more of my, I already like Delta, but if they screw something up, I'm going to balance the scale and be like, you know, mm-hmm. they also did this and they care about me. I mean, how valuable is that one thing, that affect driven action? And I, I'm a big believer, like in, in an organization has to do small, instant responses that are pervasive in the organization. Mm-hmm. So like mm-hmm. a company mm-hmm. said, uh, Pete, how do we do better at veterans? I'm like, act like you care. Yeah, you know, if a veteran resume comes in, it should get an immediate response. I see that you have it can be a robot. I mm-hmm. see that you're a veteran and you've applied for a job. Someone will get back with you shortly. That instant response, and you better have someone follow up. But to get a null response, we already think you don't like us. You already have one strike against you, you know. So start with that assumption in mind. That's like what Keith was talking about earlier. You already have this. This is this is your culture, whether you want it or not. That's where the veteran shows up with respond instantly and then follow up and then boom, you're already doing a better job because you, you've taken this simple action. And that's to the point you said earlier about ego and where does ego come into culture? And I think that it has, um, it, you act like you care, you said. Actually putting aside ego means you do care. Right. And it, it it's a very subtle distinction, but I think it's a good one to every leader should check themselves. Do I actually care? Mm -hmm. And I read somewhere, I think in the last week, some statistic that I I believe it was 60 or 70% of people who are in management really don't want to manage people. (laughs) And they're only because like, how else are you going to get up the corporate ladder and then grow your paycheck? You know, in the corporate system, that's kind of the one one pathway to do it. So you've got a lot of people who are overseeing, you know, the stewards of the company's teams and culture and performance that they don't want to do the job they're doing. <laughs> it's like, how do you get that out? I mean, you can't fix ugly, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And how expensive is that? Once again, like this stuff costs money. Why, why is CQ EQ's handmaiden? Like, why are we so obsessed with emotional intelligence? I would say if anything, CQ is greater than EQ. Not that EQ is not important and not essential, but we Hmm. refuse to accept that. If you are good at CQ, you already have an EQ element in your, you know, in your quiver. What? So what do you think is culture intelligence? I want to hear it. I oh, used- you're putting me on the spot now. I, I Luckily, I have an answer. Uh, it's cultural acuity. <laughs> it's being able to go into any cultural setting and reliably come out with a path that works within the cultures blending together. So if uh, I'm, I'm going to work overseas with, with a, uh, an Indian um, contract provider, um, I am going to reliably be able to go out and find their path and figure out how to use their path to get my mission accomplished. So I'm not going to, I'm going to look for signs of acuity results into the, in this. I'm going to look for signs of my sense of passive aggressive behavior, uh, corruption, um, you know, just incompetence. If I hear those things in my head, I'm going to stop and say, I have a cultural problem I'm not doing uh, properly because I don't understand their decision-making process and I don't understand their goals and they likely have the same thing towards me. And so we're incongruent. If you are able to do that and master that and, and be reliably good at it, you have high CQ. Good. I like that. That's, I couldn't have said it better myself. Nice. And you wrote right. the book. Make sure we hire Lisa and Pete to go out and help you with the culture. Right. I was just going to say, Pete, you're hired. <laughs> but, but people don't ever talk about that. You don't ever any of what you hear from people is like, yeah, I'm really good working overseas. 
Um, and then literally the next, this is an exact example. The next sentence, this is someone that, that Keith and I both know this person works overseas or has in the past said, my Indian partner won't do what I tell him to do. And I'm like, Oh my God, like mm -hmm. you are absolutely screwing this up. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. I hear it. Yeah. I mean, it, 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 and I have had, I had a leader at a conference ask me one time, how do you build a unified global co company culture? And I remember saying, don't. Don't. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> don't. Please don't, don't do that. Do that. <laughs> because that, again, that comes back to that just respecting people's native culture. And there can be. A, so, so I really like that you guys have both gone to the decision process, the communication processes, and the way that um, people are hired and promoted. Those are probably three of the biggest things I look at, the signals that I look at to see if those processes are, you know, buy into those processes. And so those things can be unified to some extent. You know, there can be these principles that you have. Um, it's just really difficult to create a cookie cutter culture outside, even teams within a, the same site will have a different cultural flavor to them and should. You know, tribes. I don't know. Back, I think it's the Dunbar's law. I, I believe that that is the um, name of the law that just generally points to this anthropological evidence that if you get over 150 people, you really, uh, you, 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 that's the maximum number of people that you can have that can actually be unified right. and marching in a conversation. Well, you've got these mega organizations of 150,000 people. You know, there's no way to get everybody feeling like they're part of one culture in that. You can't even, and even you know, America, which has a constitution and which has a set of cultural principles. Yes. We're not one culture. We're California and New York. Right. <laughs> and yeah. there's a big difference having <laughs> been in both. I worked at uh, Travelers, which has multi tiered CEOs okay. in this massive organization. And we had these mandatory phone calls where instead of working, you listen to somebody who you'd never met in your life who couldn't pick you out of a crowd. And you would get a briefing from them as they went down the line. It was like best year ever for Citigroup, best year ever for Travelers Insurance and Surety, best year ever from you know Travelers Bond where I work. You know all CEOs, right? Each one of these guys. And then I, literally the next day, I go into my vice president's office, and he's like, "Well, Pete, we've had a rough year." <laughs> Wait a second. Everybody <laughs> else in the organization had this fantastic year. You just got a new car. How did I have a bad year? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I thought we crushed our stretch goal. What, what happened? You know, <laughs> that incongruence, yeah. again, that's expensive. Well, and I think, you know, corporations and organizations, they, you know, they're very well known for just kind of trying to put the, the, the spin on things that they want to have come down from the top. Those corporate talking points, uh, you know the way that they want the workforce and the the members of the organization, the 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 clients, you know everybody that's associated, you know to, to kind of to see. Um, but what I found is like if people have their BS meter on and just see it as BS, then you know they're never gonna like actually believe like what's been told to them or fed to them, you know through those you know conference calls or those briefings or or leadership letter or any other way that things are going to be communicated. I think that, um, you know, again, I go back to where I started with this whole thing. When you start with the values and then when you find people that are living into those values and then you kind of allow, you fan the flame of those individuals or those units to kind of uh, grow and, to, you know, and to kind of take on a life of their own. So I don't know if I'm expressing this quite right, but let's say, you know, like I would have never planned Pete in our, our youth group back, you know, when you were a teenager, you know, to say, you know, we're going to have 20 kids come from Benicia, California, 20 miles away, you know, to be involved in this youth group, you know, but then, you know, I basically kind of let you go. I mean, I fan that flame of like, you know, you're like, hey, can I bring my friends? Yeah. You know, before I knew it, there was 20 kids that were coming from Benicia, you know, the Benicia boys with you. Right. And, uh, you know, and of course all the girls in the youth group had crushes on all of you. Right. Um, but, uh, it's anyway, popular at home, like, mainly of you, but, um, you know, <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is that, but I allowed your personality to emerge and your personality to, um, you know, to basically 
be a cultural element, you know, in that group. It wasn't the whole group, but, you know, I could have stifled that or communicated something different. But, you know, this is something that emerged within the values that we had. And it's like, okay, this is really good. And this is adding so much to what this group, the whole group's experience is. I'm just going to keep fanning that flame and, um, and seeing that, that emerge. And, and I think the same thing could happen in other types of organizations. You get a certain unit that is kind of taking on a personality and a life of its own will fan that flame. You know, if you're in multi-ethnic groups and there's a, you know, in your example of, you know, you've got vendors and partners in, you know, India, for example, and, you know, what, how, how can your whole culture be enriched by just fanning the flame of those individuals and their perspective and what they bring to the table? So, um, I had a, 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 a good friend of mine who works for one of the largest enterprise software companies in the world. And they have offices all over the world. And they were going through the conversion from in their software development process from waterfall to agile, which just is a way of I I talk about cultural agility really as a way of understanding that you need to have shorter cycles of implementation on anything you're doing so that you can have quicker change. And agile is a, a body of work that is centered around the ability to be very dynamic and customer focused. So they were making this. So they, and this is really funny. She relates this story and it's, I just, I'm, I always just, my jaw just drops when I hear these kind of things. She goes, yeah, we went about it the way we go about everything. We did the whole big, huge rollout. We got global teams together. We brought in a really fancy consultant, trained them all in this whole new methodology, hired an internal culture team that went around and internal culture team that went around and do, did what you talked about, Pete, you know, um, uh, finding the culture, right? And got massive amount of feedback about how we don't trust our leaders here. We're never going to be able to make this change. It's never going to work. Meanwhile, they're launching teams across the globe. These are scrum teams, they're called. And so now I, here I am in Colorado, have colleagues in India. I have colleagues in South America. I have colleagues in Philippines. And we're all supposed to get on Zoom at the same time and have these scrum meetings. Well, that lends itself to what we're in person, right? But you and the three of us are on time zones that are about an hour or two apart. These people were getting up in the middle of the night at midnight to go have meetings. So there was all this craziness. and, And she said, we just went about it the way we do everything. We just dive into the pool and then figure out whether we know how to swim. Yeah millions of dollars were spent and they canned the entire initiative in a year and fired the IT, the head of IT. I mean, and that just sent this whole, and then we're back to what, what are we doing now? (laughs) How are we developing our software? It's just, and this goes on all the time. And so to me, the culture is just, it's like you were saying, it's almost like it's an effect Mm -hmm. of that type of leadership or that type of decision-making process or that kind of communication or how we hire people and fire them. It's an effect. It's not something that you actually construct, as you pointed out at the very beginning. I've been rambling on a little bit too long. One of the biggest times I ever used culture to my advantage was, and it took a long time to develop this this ability to do this, but I sat down with an Afghan leader who was, you know, from our point of view, tied to the Taliban, a bad guy, and, you know, wouldn't go out to his district and govern it. And he started teaching me because I learned to shut up and listen and try to understand things from his perspective and not do anything until he's like, I'm desperate for your help, Pete. Can you do this teeny tiny little thing? Then I'm like, I'd poke my head out and be like, oh, this one little thing? Sure. Or better, let me get your partner because I wasn't even the direct partner. And so I sat down with him and I said, hey, uh, Zarif was his name. Zarif, like you're the governor of this district, the county, right? You're the governor of this county. We're trying to make the government work. You understand. And we'd finally built six months. It took to build trust with this guy. And I said, what do you want to do? Like, what's your plan? Do you even think that way? And he's like, of course, I think that way in plans. And I'm like, can I record it? Would you let me? like try to understand it and he said yeah okay and he's like how do you want me to explain and i'm like tell me what order you want to do things in and tell me what provisions that you have or should be able to get through your government and how to get those and then where do you need our help 
And so I made this whole PowerPoint slide to reflect that, right? To call the notes. And granted, this is cross language, but that's fine. I'm, I'm good with that stuff. So we, uh, I go in and I build this thing perfectly, but I'm like, I have to test this thing. So I scrambled it all up and I screwed it up like how a, a young private would do. And I handed it back to him and he said, no, 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 damn it. Here, here, here. And he started changing it back to what I had, which was his plan. And, and there are sub elements within that. That's a longer story. So I took this plan because I knew I had to do this. For one, I had to check myself. Two, I had to check up the army because I knew their culture. So I came back and I said, here's the governor's plan. Literally, no one has ever asked them for what they want to do as we try to legitimize the government. I've talked to the people in the villages. They don't think the government ever does anything for them. Here is a potential path. Potential path. This is a potential small win. So I hand it to them and they're like, there's no way on earth this guy made this PowerPoint slide. And I'm like, yeah, dummy, he didn't. I did. But I talked to him for hours and they're like, there's no way this is his plan. And, th and like, I told them the story. I'm like, I screwed it all up. He came back. He corrected it. This is his plan. And he doesn't need much from us. And that totally changed. By the time I got done getting the army to calm down and listen, it totally changed how they approached it. And they're like, okay, we're going to do less. We were burning trash. Like all of our supplies would be flown in from a, heli uh, from a plane. They would drop it in via parachute. And so we had all these cardboard boxes and these parachutes. We were burning all this cardboard and parachutes. And he's like, that stuff's valuable to me. I can govern with that. I can't get my government to give me anything. In the meantime, can I have your parachutes? Can I have your cardboard and anything you guys don't need because I can turn that into political capital for me. Hmm. Think about that win. That took six months and a ton of experience leading up to that six months to be able to sit down and be able to not only understand what he did, but also communicate it to the army in a way that made sense. I mean, you said do nothing. I think that's probably some of the very best advice that leaders <laughs> won't listen yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> How would you accomplish this, young Pete? Are you was thinking you could bring friends here? How would you do that? You know, and then Pete will go. I just ask him, and I bring him, and I'm ravenous, and I want my friends to like me. What I do, I'm just going to keep. You know, like how would you do this? Was a big question. I started asking, what would be appropriate here? How do you safely get this done in a place that's hyper dangerous? And they would say, I would do it this way. And I'm like, then I want to do it in that in that model right there. Yep. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's the killer app. <laughs> right there just go out and start asking questions but i think that we have you know, i mean the so and it'll be interesting actually to see what happens when you begin to see millennials in power in corporate mm -hmm. because they will i think change the rules but our generation which is largely still in power in corporate america especially not so much the entrepreneurial community has um i think a really different way of viewing what the job of leadership is. So our generation viewed it as I'm supposed to have the answers. And by God, if somebody asks me, you know, for the report or for the recommendation or for the, it's my job to spill out the answer. And that just creates so much vulnerability in terms of, you know, you see all these people with these um, very, holding their cards very close, but also these, these really false, um, right, right. that they're standing on because they don't have the answer. They're, they're the people that they haven't asked have it, <laughs> right? So they don't have the freedom to say I don't know. Exactly, yes. exactly. If you say I don't know, that's actually a career limiting move. <laughs> so, <laughs> and there are so many ways to get the job done. That's another thing I learned. <laughs> like, wait, you would do it this way, and that works here. Yeah. All right. Let's try your way. And wow. what do you need from me? I don't need anything. It's just going to get done. I don't have to do anything. You're going to do it and compel your people to do this. And I'm going to get what I want instead of my commander says they intend for you to do it this way. Like, dude, if you ever say my commander wants again, I'm going to tell him you said that. Yeah. <laughs> like, stop saying that. My boss wants it done this way. Okay, great. But how would this guy do it? And then can you get the same result like getting it done? It, it's not comfortable, but it is the better way to do it. I mean, Pete, I don't think change should be comfortable. It's by definition supposed to make you uncomfortable. <laughs> and I think if there was one mantra that every organization should adopt, it is let's try it. Let's try it. Because you, you talk, you hear this articles being written, Harvard Business Review and all these magazines right now about needing innovation. 
<laughs> you, you mean innovation is another one of those things like culture. It's this thing that comes, it's an effect that comes out of the behavior called, let's try this. Right. <laughs> if it works, you know, and you think, I don't know if you guys um, remember this story. There's a famous story about Thomas Watson Sr. when he was at the helm of IBM and he had a lieutenant in his leadership team that had made a gigantic mistake that cost the company a million dollars, which in today's terms would probably be about 20 times that. And the guy comes into his office, gets called into Thomas Watson's office and he's like, ready to be fired, you know, standing there. The guy, Watson looks at him and goes, you just, I just invested a million dollars in your development. You think I'm firing you now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's the spirit. <laughs> Yeah, I want to, everybody, this is Lisa's book right here. It's really incredible. I've been thumbing through it and, and look, her and, and Jerry wrote this thing and there's so much of what I already know and believe in there. So, I mean, I can definitely give it my full endorsement and Aww. it's fun to read books when you're like, yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so uh, it just, it was a treat to thumb through it and, and awesome. be able to have these kind of conversations because again, we were talking on the phone the other day when I was in Georgia and, uh, I use my example, like culture is like gravity, you know, like it's everywhere. I love that. Yeah. yeah it, it gets its take no matter what you do. Exactly. You can believe in it or not believe in it. It's still working. Yeah. It don't care. It just keeps going exactly. and you can't explain it away. You know, it's just, it's so you can choose to ignore it. You can choose to focus on EQ or whatever, but CQ, it's, it's a hugely valuable thing. You know, it's, yeah, it's pretty simple if you allow it to exist and understand that it's there. And instead of having it be collisions, you create, you know, we talked about this too. I, you create an intersection so that there's cues and clues. You're like, this, these guys are going to go by at 80 miles an hour. I'm going to let them go by and then I'm going to go. Like you yeah. have to navigate it in a way that is patient. It's deliberate work, but it is, it is the critical path though. It's absolutely true. And I love that metaphor of the intersections because they're it, it, without those cues and without some of those ground rules or there's agreements that everybody sort of abides by, you know, you're just going to have a lot of collisions. <laughs> so you can boil it down to some things that, you know, are core truths in your team or in your organization that about how we work together that actually are, are like magic. You know, and one of them, in my opinion, Keith spoke about at the very beginning, which is making it fun. I love fun. Yeah, we yeah. had we had so much really? fun <laughs> we had around the campus. I mean, come on. Oh, <laughs> and I think you know, my uh, kind of add on to that is that you know, it's like when the the preferred culture emerges, you know it. And then I think where Pete's going with his comment here is that that culture endures. You know this youth group in Walnut Creek, California was, you know, in the mid 1980s. I mean, and the kids in the youth group are now on their fifties. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and yet, you know, every year, like that has gone by even up to this year, you know, I will talk to 10 or 15 of the kids in the youth group and just like how meaningful that that group, that culture, you know, that experience was, you know, lifelong relationships, lifelong memories, lifelong impact, you know, by getting it right. So, you know, I think that there's huge upside rewards that more than just the quarterly profit reports or, you know, launching a new product, it's it's definitely, you know, what, if, if this is a culture that emerges that is right, then it has lasting impact, you know, for decades. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, which, is, which works the other way too. Oh, yes. right. yeah. <laughs> you build a culture that's stuck and you're with it for a while because <laughs> it's yeah. really <laughs> I've often said it would be easier to blow your to blow it up and start over. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I have a friend that works for a corporation, a national corporation, and this person uh, is in a situation where they interact with the public, both clients and just walk up people and everything. And because they live in an area with a lot of homeless, it's a lot of homeless activity around, too, and everything. And this person is terrified that something is going to happen to them, you know, because they're alone. There's not really any other staff there, you know, and she brings this up to the corporate headquarters. And, th and this person kills it at their job. They're, they're, all of their metrics are great. You know, they're, 
they're performing at as, as good as any other location can perform. And the corporation basically does nothing to ensure this person feels safe in a dangerous environment. They, they don't get, you know, this person meets metrics where they get rewards from the company and this person doesn't consume those rewards. And the company's just like, hey, that's great. You know, we didn't spend money on that or whatever. And I hear that. And I'm just like, I wish someone would just go over there and shake the CEO and say, can I tell you what's happening at your company? But I would never want to harm my my friend. That's why I'm very protective of, of this person's identity, gender, where they live, all these things, because I don't want anybody to know. But this, it's shocking to me how if something was to happen to this person physically, which is no one could rule that out because of where they work and what they have to do. And their job is not a dangerous job, by the way. It's it's a, a it's a forward facing corporate job. Um, it would be if the, if this person survived this attack, it would be millions of dollars of of this in such a preventable thing. What is it about companies that makes them afraid to create a feeling of of safety? You know, and I'm not saying be paralyzed by fear, but this we're not talking about that. We're talking about someone who's on their own and never and never accepts the accolades and the rewards that they get because they're so disaffected. Well, I think there's two things. I mean, I can answer that straight up. And one of them is HR. Sorry if you're on HR and you're listening to this, because human resources is a compliance-based function um, historically, organizationally, and they don't necessarily are not fully rewarded for the compassionate policy making that you just described. And the second thing I think, it, it, you know, you pointed to the airplane example earlier, and I'm going to use it as a metaphor. If you're a CEO, you're flying at 30,000 feet. You really don't know what's happening on the ground. So you rely on your ground troops to tell you. And as we've pointed out, there are not safety mechanisms in place for that communication to go up the chain. So I've been in boardrooms where people are making decisions where I don't think they're uncaring humans. They're just Pretty much like all of us, you know, they do care, but they don't have the line of sight to who they're caring for and what the needs are of those people. So you put those two kind of dynamics together. And I think it explains a lot of it. I don't think that most people and, and you know, and then you've got just a whole lot of people in frontline management that don't want to be there. So you, it's a com, it's a combustion yeah. <laughs> in that situation of why that happens organizationally. But the smaller you can maintain that 150 Dunbar's number, I think, in terms of tribes. I've known companies, do you know the company, um, and I don't know if they're still doing this, that has the um, home advisor, right? So you can go online and find yourself a yeah. person to do whatever chores around the house you don't want to do or don't know how to do. And they started exploding in terms of growth. They bought Angie's List. They went through this massive expansion. And they literally here in Colorado, their headquarters are here in Colorado. They started breaking up the company once they got past that 150. They literally put a brand new, opened a brand new office and that office has a whole different culture, you know, and one of them is downtown and has a lot of kids and has a really cool culture. And one of them has a little more family culture, you know, so there's, I think a lot of things that companies can do that are very, that very, are very much are architectural and design oriented to make the conditions for the effect called culture the best that it can be. Let me and ask you a harder story. Let me ask you a hard question. So, yeah. Yes. You're in a company like this. You're listening to the Break It Down show and you're like, they're, they're, are they talking about me? And we're not talking about you. <laughs> but um, how do they create this change? Because you and I both know if we call the CEO and say, I have really good news, I can help you with your cultural problem, they don't call back. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to yeah. sell the bad news that we bring. You know, because we look under we look under the hood and we're like, hey, uh, all of these problems you don't know you're having. Here's what they look like. And then people lose their minds and they don't want to cut a check because, you know, I didn't need you two days ago. I don't need you now. Yeah, no, that's so real. And I, it's, I've never been inside an organization literally engaged where the CEO wasn't driving it because of that, where the CEO didn't either get that intelligence somewhere. And usually, Gary and I have talked about this for years, that comes from having failed massively at some ma massive change implementation. So they were part of a merger, they were part of a turnaround, it didn't work, they knew culture was the reason that they're, they're going to get out in front of it. But yeah, if, if, if the how do you go about it, if you're trying to do it yourself, it's, it's what you said at the beginning, I, I don't, I don't think it's the easiest thing that you could sign up to do. 
<laughs> but you could start with your own team and creating some practices and some of them are in my book and I've got I've got a website by the way I wanted to just mention this that's um I created this magazine because I because exactly what you're talking about Pete I wanted to share stories of successful cultural implementation because it does have that mystique CEO says we're doing the culture change and we have walked into those organizations sat in the executive room you look around the table and you know that 80% of the people sitting here think it's just hooey they the other 20% don't know what it is so it, it, because it has that mystique about it, you do have to make it concrete. And you do, our work has always been about driving high performance in companies as the outcome of doing the culture work. And I think that you've to you, you you've got to marry those two things. I mean, businesses are in business to make money. So somehow you've got to point it at that. And when you're talking about the military, even any of those outcomes that leaders are held accountable for, you've got to link the culture work to them for sure. And I'm putting a link for the magazine in the oh, uh, show notes right now. So this will be up here in a second. Yes. Um, and I want to hear there are listeners that are in, that have a good story to tell or have a good tool to offer. I'm, you know, I'm doing what you're some version of what you're doing, which is doing Zoom interviews so that we can share these stories, put them into the magazine. So it's appreciated that you're doing that, because I think we do all need to un unveil the mystique about what this culture thing is. It's like gravity. <laughs> <laughs> it is. And we could do these stories all day long. I'll do a real quick one. A friend of mine works at a, a refining place. And every so every few years, they have to turn down part of the, uh, they call it a, a, a turnaround, a part of the refinery. And every year on the little list of things they do is like, we have to get that one crane that costs $10,000 a day. And every year, there's a change in the plan because they won't change the plan. And so my friends, like if they if they gave enough to care about me, I would tell them to not get that crane until two weeks from now, because every year we have to rebuild this element of the job. And so the crane sits there and costs, you know, and it's just a quarter million dollars. Who cares? Right. But it's a quarter million dollars that they refuse to save. I could go out and find a million dollars in that place right now mm -hmm. because of, of that, of the, the what I call the spaceship is not communicating with the ground. Here's another illustration of that. Yeah, I was in a, a, a Afghan um, army area and I was in the army uh, staff room and they were talking about things and they knew that I'd been out and about and, and there was a bit of a test for me. And so this a very senior State Department person said, hey, Pete, um, what TV channels do they watch in that valley to see like, you know, if I knew my stuff? And I, it was great. I got to say, Dennis, they don't have electricity in that valley. And it completely changed the paradigm in that room because they didn't know the ground truth. Like you're worried about TV stations, you're challenging me. Turns out, you know, like you need more of me out there to give you the reality of what's going on. Like you can't, how are you going to make these decisions? You're not only in, not in a vacuum, you're in a spaceship inside of the vacuum in a different place, nowhere near the reality where the work, like if you can't identify where the work is, you got a big problem. And it's a culture level, right? I agree with you. I think if you're in the business of doing culture, you know, so many of, of the people that are doing it are calling it's like, you're going to feel better, you're going to engage your employees, you're going to have, you know, they're kind of pitching it around this like soft side of the business. But in the end, I can walk around an organization um, of almost any size and find at least a million dollars is left on the table because of the way you're treating your people and the way the way that you're making decisions, the way you're communicating, the way that you're hiring and promoting. When a, one of my favorite questions, whenever I get hired to do this kind of work is to sit down with the person who's doing the job that nobody, like it's just thankless, like outbound calls, yeah. right, whatever. Yeah. Like, what's next for you with this company? And it's a game changer. You know, I don't start with that, but I get there and then they'll like, they laugh. And if they laugh, I'm like, no, you don't have to say anything else. I'm just right down. They laughed. And then you bring that to the CEO. You're like, and the other thing I, I always ask them when I get the opportunity, which is never often enough, I'll, I'll ask the CEO, like, are you guys great at training people? The answer to that question is always yes. Yes, of course. We find the best people and we train them. We're great at it. Would it be helpful to see the people that have not left this company and are now in senior positions at other places? And they're like, um, yes, I would. <laughs> Are we letting that much talent get away? I'm like, I don't know, but would it be helpful? And it's always yes, because you do try to have, like if you have this state-of-the-art training program and hiring system, why are you bleeding vice presidents and, mm -hmm. and you know director of this 
type people. Like, why aren't you getting those people into your organization to help you? That, come on, Lisa, how expensive is that? It, it, well, at that level, five times salary and benefits to replace someone like that. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of those folks don't work out, you know, because you bring somebody in at that higher level. So true. And I know a lot of organizations, I think this is kind of cool. Some I, I don't um, think it's widespread yet, but you're starting to see a movement around um, alumni clubs of people who've left the company. And then you kind of have some form of social connection that you keep to the organization in case you want to come back. Because it used to be if you left, that was betrayal. <laughs> right? If you quit and went to a competitor, but now you're seeing, I think companies getting a lot more realistic too about that um, because of what you just said, you've, you just walked out the door, walked a huge amount of the competitive intelligence and advantage for your business. And it's, they're taking it to your competitor. Not How does someone get into this line of work. I mean, you don't pick cultural consultant when you're 17 years old about to graduate high school. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, but you know what? I always had, I always had a curiosity about people. So I think that was sort of the the seed that was planted in me pretty early. I was always that girl who would sit and listen more than I would talk. Which even being here today is a little uncomfortable for me because I would rather listen to your story. I thought we were talking too much over you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I, I'm a, and, and, but I did, um, here's how it came about that we became culture experts. We were working inside, I can even say this, at, at Merck. We were, were doing a, a program that was their flagship leadership development program. And it was, of all things, a three day training class on how to run effective meetings that had, faci that facilitate effective meetings that had, full engagement of the people in the room. And people would come in at the vice president level and they'd be like, why are we having to sit through a three-day training on meetings, right? And by the end of it, of course, they were completely you know, singing a different tune. But after we did uh, inside Merck, a, a couple of sites where we did a full-scale implementation of that particular training class, they started saying, this is changing our culture. And, I'm, and that's what got me to understand meetings are really the arena or playing field for culture. It's the place where people come together, right? And how those are conducted and run has a huge impact on, mm. the, you know, on, on shaping and having the effect that you want to have in the culture. So that's, so we branded as corporate culture pros. We thought, well, listen to the customer. Yeah. <laughs> They're telling us that's what it's doing. Let's just go figure this out, how to make it more intentional. Yeah. That was about, it was 2003, I think that we, that we did that. Yeah. And it's been, and, it, and it was also kind of an interesting thing that I didn't think that you could find business on the internet. I'm just being really transparent. So we built a whole website and did search engine optimization. And we were busy for years and years and years off of that. I mean, I still get leads today off of and it just surprises me because usually you would think this is the kind of thing where, but you know what it is, CEOs, especially and, and top leaders, they don't necessarily want to go out and say to their colleague, do you need a culture expert? <laughs> it's like saying, do you want to meet my therapist? <laughs> <laughs> so you have to be a little crafty. Or have a colonoscopy. <laughs> I pooped an envelope the other day. You don't have to get a colonoscopy anymore. You can just poop in a box or an envelope. It's great. <laughs> I have a version of that. It's called my culture builder toolkit. <laughs> You just go poop in a box, right? Yeah, I got my poop in a box. No, that, that, that's fantastic. And I love hearing that because I didn't know. I mean, look, you look back and you see the thread, right? You know, like I'm, like Keith said, I'm be 51 in about a month. And it all makes sense in the rearview mirror. But yeah, you know, right. to, get, to get to where I got to, I had to be, I have a high tolerance for uncertainty, obviously a high tolerance for danger, and then just a, a powerful curio curiosity. And then I became, because I deployed enough, I became a master at question asking, you know, and my primary question is just to say something like, what keeps you up at night? Mm -hmm. And then just sit back and let them fill the space. And it, it, that stuff is gold to a CEO. And, you, and you're 100 percent right. If the CEO, if the commander, if the person isn't on board, if they're not providing top cover, because it's going to hurt when I bring my knowledge in. You're going to be like, this is going to sting. You can take it, though, because it's not... <laughs> Not liking it and having it hurt does not mean it doesn't exist. You know, we can work on this problem, 
But if you don't, if you if you let the staff kill me, then you won't succeed. Uh, I mean, and you know, when I have this gift, I put myself through college typing legal briefs in the days before transcription services and artificial yeah. intelligence did that, right? And so I would interview people um, or, or do take the, the dictation kind of, you know, the Leo, and I learned how to type about as fast as a person can talk because I was lazy. I didn't want to have to rewind. So yeah. <laughs> I just learned to type really, really fast. So when I do my interviews, I can type verbatim what they're saying. Mm. I don't have to remember it and I use their words. And so then I'll put this report together, yes. 52 pages of what they're saying. And I deliver that to the CEO, you know, over, usually over a weekend. Uh huh. <laughs> and it's like, oh, dagger in the heart, you know, to read this is what your people are feeling. And that always gets them because those answers wouldn't be coming. Right. But, to them directly, even if they were the kind of CEO that that asked and listened, unless you've just done that repeatedly over and over again. So it's a valuable it's a valuable insight to have that kind of intelligence, you know, that internal view of what people are really thinking. And usually what you find and I don't know, Pete, if you found this, I know, Keith, you've had the same experience. You'll find that it's kind of incredible when you interview 50 or 100 people over, you know, over the organization and you hear the same thing. Yep. Over mm -hmm. and over again. And that question, because I would do a lot of that too, because it was translated, I would have time mm -hmm. to write as verbatim as you can when you're doing a translation. Yeah. But you would hear my question pattern in this. And I would a lot of times just cut and paste that into the thing so you can see that I didn't load this question up. You know, like when we point at the government building and we say, what goes on there? And the farmer laughs and says that that guy owes you money for a goat. The commander wants to know, like, wait, wait a second. Like they laughed at the government building. I thought we were building a government. And this is, you know, this is 15, 12, 15 years into this fight. You know, as the boss, you're like, we haven't gotten past laughing at the government yet. You know, and it's like, I love when they laugh. I love it because it's like preposterous to them, you know. And then, and then sometimes I'll be snarky and I'll put a note in there like Pete's note. They think this is preposterous. <laughs> you know, just to, like <laughs> set it in there because this is a consultant's recommendation. <laughs> yeah, and I use these stories because they aren't abnormal or rare at all in organizations. You know, like you have these beliefs in mind. I would watch, like kind of like Keith. I would go to the unit and see how they communicated, and go, okay, I know what your mission is because you know I, it's written on the wall, and. Uh, I see how you're communicating and there's a lot of assumptions as to what's happening. So let me just go test these assumptions. And I already know that in three weeks, they'll be like, who the hell is this new guy? And why does he, why is he giving us all this bad news? And then the next thing you know, I'm talking to the commander directly. And I would tell him in three weeks, you'll get it. And in three months, I'll be the most valuable asset you'll have. You'll look at me and you'll tell me that you don't have to have that conversation because we just had it right now. You'll look at me, I'll look at you and it'll be done. And they'll be like, okay, I'll take you up on that. And then three months later, the guy would look at me and be like, you want to sit on the couch? You know, time you want to talk. You know, it's yeah. like, that's how powerful a cultural expert can be, though. It, it, right. it, a lot of times the cultural expert is actually inside the organization. I have found in my consulting work mm -hmm. and in my leadership roles within culture is that, you know, there are a few people within the organization that have it to totally dialed in. And so, like, I'm not making up my report or my assessment at the end of the day, you know, out of thin air. It's like really being fed back to me by, again, listening and, and, and finding those key people that are going to really tell me how it is and not be afraid to speak that. So, you know, one story that I've often told uh, back when I was in college, my parents were at Disneyland um, staying in Anaheim. And they were like, we want to go check out the Christa Cathedral. So they showed up at 8 p.m. Everything was closed. There was one custodian at the Christa Cathedral who proceeded to take them on a two-hour insider's cook's tour of the entire Christa Cathedral, the staff office buildings, Dr. Schuler's study, um, and all while providing commentary on the political issues going on in the church and and opinions on different people's influence and impact and where the, what the strategic plans were. And this was a custodian, you know, at nine o'clock at night in an empty, <laughs> on an empty campus, and just giving them the full, yeah. you, know, the, the, you know, all the dirt and all the good stuff too, but everything. And so 
you know, I literally, you know, Pete, the church that we met, I was offered the job. I literally went over um, one evening before I accepted the job and I hung out with Ernie, the custodian who did the exact same thing for me, told me everything that was happening there before I said yes to that job. And I've done that with Mm -hmm. some kind of form of, you know, kind of uh, a line level worker, (laughs) you know, not not at the higher echelons because I'm getting the leadership picture at the top. But, you know, how is this really playing out, you know, with people that are more some of the lower rungs of the organization? And they'll tell you exactly the truth. And it's like, okay, will you accept this? Will you factor this in terms of like where you're going to go with this whole thing? So, Mm. I love that story. Amen. (laughs) <laughs> I think my mom told me she's like, so don't ever accept a job at a church without going and talking to the custodian first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, because <laughs> then you get to get the real, the real, uh, the real picture. <laughs> this is su- that's such an important thing to talk to those folks that are often invisible because they hear and they see everything. Uh huh. They're and so they're- powerful. Yeah. We we would do these. Uh, quarterly assessments in Afga- Afghanistan to see how we were doing all internal. Right. And I learned to ask these great questions. And so we'd all sit down this classified meeting. We're going to talk about the uh, Afghan government and how, how great it's doing. And uh, I raised my hand. Is this the kind of meeting we can actually contribute to, or should I just sit back and listen you know, nice and loaded? And they're like, no, of course you should contribute. Where are the Afghans? Uh, this is a classified <laughs> meeting. Yeah. But we're analyzing their government and how we're doing. Why aren't they here? Why don't we, declassify the meeting and they're like uh no 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 that's not the kind of meeting this is i'm like i raise my hand again why not (laughs) how many times were you demoted pete (laughs) i got kicked off of camps all the time you know that's why i learned i'd have the commander support and i would tell the commander they're going to kick me off of camps because i'm going to do things like say why not you know yeah Um, Absolutely. And I would like we get these responses in email, like you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I'm like, no, no, I actually, you can argue with my analysis, but not with my observation. I actually saw this. I actually saw you roll your eyes at a guy who we call governor and dismiss him in front of his peers. And then I saw that governor go and leave the tent and go to his escape on the American camp and play video games to cool off because he wanted to kill you. I actually saw that. I didn't write that in the report, but mm-hmm. you know, these are, and this is not in any way rare. I mean, this happens in corporations all the time. I was, um, you know, we had a high call sales job, like goal always going up, super high stress. And uh, they're like, hey, you have to go to this training. It's a whole day. And I'm like, but my job is to be on the phone. Then you got to go to this inclusion training. And so I went to inclusion training the whole damn day and walked out feeling more excluded and knew that, that I was never going to blast at that company. That's what that, and the CEO would love to know, like, I just taught a guy that he doesn't belong here. It was like, it was all me. It's on you to be included. And I'm like, I'm working my heart out here, <laughs> you know, struggling, drowning. Yeah. And, uh, these things, they happen all the time. It's those folks on the ground, Keith, like you said, they have all the knowledge. Yep. It, yeah. And, uh, and I think also that there's, if you, you can see sometimes even in organizations where you've got pockets of that happening that are really amazing and that producing an amazing result. And I know that there's an example of a, um, an organization that is in the mining industry, which is heavily safety oriented. Okay. So I know there's aspects around military that are like that as well. And they were, they were, what was the consultants phrase? We're lucky, not good that we haven't killed anybody. We haven't killed anybody because we're lucky, not because we're good. And so they implemented a whole entire program around psychological safety. And it took some real doing to get these like tough minor supervisor type people (laughs) to embrace the idea that you're going to create psychological safety in humans, you know? And it's like, what? We got to just have like, we have to have job site safety. Yeah. (laughs) What is Another who we up here in the mind, and they did it, and they haven't had an incident in five years, not even an incident. And it's, is- so there's power in people feeling like they are part of a tribe and feeling cared for. There's a lot of power in it that produces real business outcomes. You know. Yeah, this goes back to Keith's organizational cultural example earlier. I've been in army units where, like, they literally their motto is "There's always time for safety." But do they mean ah, "There's always time for safety," or do they mean yeah. It's always time. And then because those 
create different responses to danger. Like we will not act. We will always act towards safety, you know? So you have to be in the middle somewhere. Yes, there's always time for safety. However, in this case, we're going to not do the safe thing because we have to do this action to get the mission done, you know? And then the other ones were like, ah, and they are you know, like, you guys are absolutely out of control. And, you know, and then organizationally, you've got to work within that as, you know, someone like me, who's like, you guys are doing these actions. Someone's going to die two units ago, same pattern, same path. And you got to talk to the right person organizationally, and then they need to tighten up. But again, that's got to come externally. It doesn't, it doesn't hardly ever work externally. Right. It doesn't bubble up from inside the ego right. <laughs> of the person who's in running the show. Yeah. It, you know, and that one, I think that to that one, that's a really good example also of, a, of, of the power of culture, because once you, you know, create that, say, team or that pod or that group of people that are practicing these unfamiliar skills and they're all rolling their eyes at first and they're, you know, just sitting, I mean, they literally put, I asked him, I said, how did you do it? He goes, yeah. we put them all in a room together and we had them share stories of their, how they grew up and had them share stories of their family and yes. had them share stories about each other. You just made them care for one another. Right. right. And once that happened, and then you kind of taught them some of the tools of how to communicate, how to handle when you see somebody doing something that you know is not safe. Right. Because normally you would just kind of like, I'm just going to look the other way. I'm not going to notice that that's happened. You know, hopefully it works out for that person. But they would literally call that stuff out because now I care about you. I don't want you to die. Get yeah. off that ladder. <laughs> you know? So I think it's that. I'm going to flap my mouth some more here because this yeah. I, I want to uh, um, really heighten these points because it's so important. You know, one of the things I had to learn how to do was how to communicate with commanders. And then the sergeant majors were killing me because I'm a guy who doesn't look like them, doesn't act like them, but I'm, I am them. Right. And so I'm like, I got to figure out how to get these guys in my mind. And they're desperately concerned about safety. And so I would come to them proactively and say, you know, day to day, you're not going to need much of my help because I'm focused on commander type things. However, because I go on a lot of missions throughout the unit and throughout the area, I will see when these guys aren't doing things right. And I've been in every kind of unit. So I know like if they're not strapping things down, you know, if they're doing things that I know aren't safe, that kind of thing, I don't want to call them out directly because that will compromise my integrity with them. But I do want to know, can I bring that stuff to you? Are you interested in that? But you can't let anybody know. And they're like, yes, they were desperate to know this stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would say like, Hey, this unit has ammo boxes all on the back of their, you know, their truck, but we're all sitting and anything happens, that ammo goes flying everywhere. It's super dangerous. And they would be able to then lead in their own way to create the safety. And then those guys became invaluable to me because someone would try to cut my neck in a staff room. I wouldn't even be in there. And they'd be like, you better leave that guy alone. You know, <laughs> and they would come to me like so-and-so tried to kill you today. Yeah. yeah. And I was like, golly, look at that. You know, you have to have these advocates throughout the organization to create this cultural change of, right. you know, whatever it is. Champions, culture champions of some yeah. kind who are willing to sort of hold up the mirror. Yeah, to that. And that example, too, is I think it, I don't know, Pete, you know, did they know your intent? You know, because sometimes that speaks louder than, then, but I think there's just so much, there's so much fear of being shamed about this. I don't know the answer, or I got called out for doing something wrong that that almost trumps the <laughs> intent. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, boy intent. I could go on all day about intent. Uh, okay. Let's let's plug what you're doing so everybody can kind of go out and, and check yeah. out the uh, the work. And if you are in the world of culture or you think you might have a cultural problem at your company, um, well, first off, you can always get the book. That's a great example. But how else? What else do you want to plug, Lisa? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a uh, if you are having a culture problem, you need to probably need what we've been talking about, which is a cultural assessment. We do perform those at Culture Pros and would love to hear from you. And I'm also that kind of person that will just get on the phone with anybody and just talk to them about what's going on in their organization. And usually even with you know 30 minutes, you're going to walk away with some kind of insight. It's not about necessarily hiring us, but would love to have that conversation. And you can reach me at Lisa at corporateculturepros.com or on LinkedIn. I think it's up there on the show notes. It was, yeah. 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 I, I love to talk about this stuff, as you can tell, all day long. <laughs> so I'm um, really, really pleased to have been able to do that here in this kind of conversational way. Keith and Pete, you guys just drew out so many amazing points about culture that I wouldn't have even thought of. 
<laughs> so and I would just say, you know, just to add to what you just said, Lisa, is that you, you are producing this quarterly magazine, um, yeah. uh, 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 corporate culture as well. And so Attraction, Attraction Culture Magazine is probably, yeah. designed to share stories of how we can produce cultures that attract and retain great talent. And I am looking for stories, great stories. These are not my articles, although I'll write one or two for the for the magazine, but definitely looking at the opportunity to hear stories. So reach out to me if you've got one. <laughs> right, and people can subscribe to that through your website as well, or through the link that's on the screen. And I would say the other thing that before COVID hit, you were doing a lot of keynote speaking for, um, for leadership meetings at different companies. And I know, you know, that's kept you off the airplane the last eight or nine months, um, but you're finding some traction around doing keynotes um, in this virtual type environment. And then hopefully in six to eight months, you could be back on the road again to do um, more of those uh, conferences that you were doing before. So, you know, I would just, uh, you know, say to listeners out there that this is another way to engage uh, Lisa and her, you know, broad knowledge and expertise in this area uh, within your company or organization. Absolutely. Thank you, Keith. Oh, no. Uh, our pleasure to have you on. Keith, anything else for you in closing? No, great. It's great to be on, Pete. And thank you for making this uh, just so conversational and um, fun yeah. and inspiring and um, just grateful for the work that you're doing just to be kind of a um, kind of a public forum for just some great ideas around, you know, the general trends in our culture and uh, uh, whether it's, you know, the area of, of, of music or uh, what's happening in, in business or just uh, uh, things in the arena of politics. Uh, you did a great job with all this and uh, just grateful to be a part of it. Oh, thanks, everybody. Thank you. All right.